Good morning, good morning to you all and a very special welcome to you if you are here with us for the first time. My name is Idi and I'm one of the church wardens here at the Epiphany Anglican Church, Hopers Crossing. If you believe in God some of the time or none of the time at all or all of the time, you are welcome here. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome in this virtual place of worship. Not just by me and not just by the Epiphany family, but by God who revealed himself in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our brother, our friend, and our savior. We hope that you are well. And if you're like me, I hope that you're excited that we're getting closer to the end of stage four lockdown more than we were last week or the week before. Let us continue to take one day at a time, it can only get better. Need I say more? God has been faithful to us. Even the daily numbers of the virus infected people have come tumbling down. My brothers and sisters, join me as we give our God a round of applause for all our answered prayers. We say Ebenezer, thus far the Lord has brought us. And yes, we're still going. The end may not be in sight, but the one thing that we know is every day and every hour, God remains faithful to us. Go on, raise up prayers to our Lord, to our Heavenly Father, because his arm is not too short to save us, and his ear is not too heavy to hear us. God is fast answering our prayers. You know why? Because you are valued by the Lord, and he has a purpose for you. He has placed within you special gifts that he longs for you to use as you go about in his vineyard. Maybe you are here because you need forgiveness or you need to forgive. Maybe you're tired and you need a little space to breathe. Maybe you're trying church for the first time or maybe you're trying church for the last time. Maybe you spent your whole life wondering if God really loves you. Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you came here because you're sick. Maybe you came here looking for a miracle. Maybe you came here looking for something else, but you got disorientated and you found yourself here instead. You know what? With God, there are no accidents. With God, there is hope and healing and miraculous companionship even though it may feel virtual at the moment, but be rest assured that just by his word, we are healed. With God, there is space to breathe and forgiveness on top of forgiveness. With God, there is love. He says, come unto me, ye that are heavily laden, and I'll give you rest. With God here in our midst this morning as we worship him. Maybe we will hear those words that split open the heavens. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are my beloved. In you, I am well pleased. Let's take time to listen to the voice of God. He still speaks. And this is why we gather together here at the Epiphany week after week after week, to virtually encourage faith in Jesus Christ, to equip each other for discipleship, and to engage in missions in and around the communities that we are based in. And this starts within our own immediate families. Today, Glenn will talk to us about how Jesus overcomes our fears how Jesus did it 2,000 years ago, and how he still does it today. I hope in the midst of the worship music, the prayers, the kids' time, Glenn's message and all, there will be a nugget of something that you can grab hold of. Something that will help you go even higher in your praise and worship. 
something that you could leave here this morning and say, my spirit was truly rewardingly blessed. I pray that you don't leave this platform today before committing or recommitting your life to Jesus. Because you know what? God, our Father, is bigger than all your fears and all any other problems that you may be faced with right now. Family, let's just bow our heads and pray as the worship team comes to lead us in music. Heavenly Father, our provider, our maker, and our protector, through your goodness, we are alive and healthy enough to gather and worship you today. We are grateful for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for letting us walk with you each day. We know that you are with us in each and every moment of our lives. Help us to lean into you more and to each other, understanding that all other ground around us is sinking sand. We thank you for fulfilling your promises and inspiring us with your goodness. In this moment, we come before you, Lord, and we lay our lives at your feet. May we continue to adore and worship you with every fiber of our being. Father, may we always praise you and come to know you better. Today, as we join together in worship, may we sing of your greatness and wonder. We pray that we might know how wide and how deep and how long and how high your love is for us. As your servant, Glenn, delivers your word to us. Open up our hearts and our spiritual ears so we may hear you speak to us clearly. Be present in our midst. And may this be a prophetic reset for families to emerge stronger than ever before. Lord, we love you. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
kids time boys and girls today we're talking about emotions and in particular fear do you ever experience fear I do what's something you're afraid of Ashton well boys and girls I'm terrified of snakes oh I don't like snakes very much myself nor spiders too much mm. but you know what I'm really scared of I'm scared of heights and when I'm in a tall building looking down oh I feel so scared I just don't like it and where do you feel the emotion when you're scared? Where do you feel it in your body? Well, when I feel scared, I feel it in the pit of my stomach. Yeah, so do I. I get all knotted up in my stomach. And you know, in the ancient world in Israel, they used to say that's where emotions came from, from your stomach, not from your heart. We talk about emotions coming from the heart. So we send love hearts to people, don't we? Mm -hmm. And when we say we're in love, we talk about our heart. But when you're in love, you don't feel any butterflies in your heart, do you? You feel it in your stomach, is that right? And when you're scared, you feel it in your stomach. So maybe girls and boys, you've experienced that, you know? Maybe you have to do an exam or a test and you feel all knotted up in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you have a competition, some sport that you're competing in, and it's a big event and you feel before the game all knotted up. Or maybe you need to speak in front of the class or the whole school. Oh, then you feel it. It's a bit like this, your intestines. So imagine this, your intestines all get knotted up. Will you want to mop that up for us? This is sort of what happens when we're filled with fear. We get all knotted and twisted inside. So Ashton's going to try and twist that up for us. Oh, look at that. Okay, I want to pretend that's your stomach and your intestines all knotted up with fear. It's all twisted. It doesn't matter what you do. You just, yeah, it's just, it's all knotted up. Well, I want to do another experiment for the girls and boys today, and I've got some beads here, so I'm going to give you some of these beads. So, some over there, half for you and half for me. And I want you to write one positive emotion on those beads, and I'm going to write one negative emotion. You might be able to guess which negative emotion I'm going to write. But girls and boys, Ashley's going to do a positive one. So you want a blue or a black sharpie? Blue. Blue. Blue for you. I'm going to take red because I'm writing a negative one and I'm going to write the emotion fear. What are you going to write? I think I'll write joy. Okay, joy is a good emotion. So I'm going to write fear on these pebbles. F. E. Just so I can spell. A. Uh, have you got joy there? I have. Okay, let's hold up Joy. I'll do the I'll do the J part. There's J. Oh. O R. When J O R. J O R Y. We're gonna try, I'm thinking of fear. J O Y. We're gonna drop that in there. And when we drop joy into our life, I wonder what happens. There's a bit of reaction. There's something happening in our life. But when you look down there, I can see it enlarged like it's actually bigger and I can see joy really bright. And that's what happens when we've got joy or love or peace in our life. It creates a reaction in our lives, but it actually shines out for everyone to see. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what happens if we've got fear. I'll spell this one correct this time. I'll do the F E. And there we are. You can hold up the A R fear. And what happens when we have fear in our life? Let's drop the fear into our life. Drop it in, all, all, all in, and oh my goodness, look at that. Oh, I cheat. No, I got it. Did you see that, girls and boys? What a mess that made. So when we have positive emotions in our life, like joy and love and peace, 
there's a reaction, but it magnifies it. Everyone can see it. But when there's fear or anger, it explodes out of our life. And not only does it ruin our lives, it affects, look at this, it's gone everywhere. It affects everyone around us. And that's what happens when we're filled with fear. And that's why in the Bible, the phrase that is used most often is fear not, but trust in God. Because when we trust in God, he unknots our fears like this. And it's a bit like we allow Jesus into our life. This, let's be saying this is Jesus. It's like having Jesus come into our life. You try and put a knot in that now, Ashton. Can you, is it going to bend? Can't bend it? Why? Because we've got Jesus in our life. And he stops us from getting all knotted up inside because he creates for us the straight path that we can walk. And he gives us peace. So when we've got Jesus in our life, we have peace. When we've got Jesus in our life and there's love, joy, peace and patience and the fruit of the Spirit, we see it magnify and it bubbles up and it bubbles up with joy. But when we have negative emotions like fear or anger, it just explodes out and it goes everywhere and it affects us, but it affects everyone around us. Mm -hmm. So girls and boys, I want you to remember that because the scriptures tell us never go to bed and let the sun set on your anger. And do not fear because God is with you. So we want you to remember that. That when you're feeling those fears in the pit of your stomach, when you see a snake and you feel fear, when I'm looking out of a building and I'm looking down and I feel fear, remember that Jesus takes away all fear and he is with us always. See you next week, girls and boys. Good morning, Jewish family. I'm Roz. And I'm Graham. And we go to the 8 o'clock service. And we're thinking of you and your family at this time. And we'd just like to encourage you with Psalm 62, 8, Trust in Him. Roz and I both grew up in Lailor. We actually went to the same kinder, the same state school, and the same high school at different times of our lives. Also, would you believe, we were delivered by the same midwife at the Preston Hospital. We were married in 1974 at St John's Epping. Then we moved to Hoppers Crossing where we've raised three children and now we have five grandchildren. Hello, I've retired now. I left school when I was 15 and started working for my father in a service station as a motor mechanic. I also used to work on weekends. I used to uh, ride my push bike from uh, from Lawler or Laylaw, which you want to call it, all the way down to uh, Fitzroy, and used to catch the train back from Clifton Hill back to uh, to Lawler, and uh, did that for a few years. Then uh, we got rid of the service station, moved on to more in the transport, and uh, then I used to drive a truck for the for Dad, and also on weekends after uh, I had the driver's license, used to work for uh, Ros and Dad delivering briquettes on a Saturday, and carting grass hay on a Sunday. And then uh, later on, we just uh, that went by, and we just stuck on uh, driving the truck for Dad. He retired. I took over the business, and uh, now that business now has been handed on to my son. And uh, I enjoy my retirement uh, at home, doing what I like to do in the garden and uh, a few handyman jobs. Hello, I've retired now. My first job was when I was 17, and that was selling newspapers at the kiosk at Laylaw at the train station. I used to start at five o'clock in the morning. Then I did a short course and got a job as an admin assistant at Hoadley's Chocolates. I then went on to do payroll there and that's what I was doing when I left there after seven years to be a full-time mum and when my Three children were all attending Heathdale Christian College. I went back to work at the family business and I got a, I was doing payroll, which was I really enjoyed. I worked in our family business until 2016 when I retired when Graham with Graham and now we spend our time together doing gardening visiting friends and looking after our grandchildren which we absolutely love. We've been going to Epiphany Anglican Church since 1979. 
I was involved with Glenda Smith's Bible study group and then we, I started a ladies group and I got involved with running play group. Then when I had to go back to work, we started a Bible study group in our home over Wednesday evening, which it, we had for over 20 years. We have really appreciated and been very blessed by all our friends at Epiphany. And in this strange time, we are praying that we'll be all able to meet again like we used to. Today's reading is taken from Mark chapter 4, verses 35, following. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still not have any faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him any more, not even a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us amongst the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of de demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. And then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, a man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how many how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jurius came and said to Jesus, He fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, 
My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subjected to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she'd heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once Jesus realised that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you asked, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. With trembling and fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came to the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by hand and said to her, Talitha, come which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Well, welcome as we continue looking at God's word together. Over the the past few weeks, we have been looking at Matthew's Gospel. And this morning, we're continuing to do that, though in a somewhat unusual way. We're going to actually be looking at Mark's Gospel. And the reason for that is that the four stories that we're looking at this morning are exactly the same in Matthew's Gospel as they are in Mark's, except Mark's version of these stories is shorter and more succinct. And therefore, I'm going to use Mark's version. So let us just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you may open up your word to us this morning and reveal your truths, that it may indeed be a light within our lives. And that you might indeed grant us the courage and the strength to live out these truths in our lives to your praise and glory. Amen. What things do you most fear? If you were to categorise your fears, I suspect that they would fall roughly into four categories. Firstly, fear of uncertainty, fear of the unknown, fear of not being in control, the type of fear that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused. Secondly, fear of evil, fear of violence and conflict, whether that be personal or societal. Thirdly, fear of disease, of ageing, and finally, fear of death itself. And each of the four stories that we're going to be looking at this morning addresses one of those distinct fears. The calming of the storm is about overcoming the fear of uncertainty and the unpredictable, the fear of not being in control. The casting out of evil spirits is about overcoming evil and violence in the world. The story about 
The healing of a woman who'd suffered bleeding for 12 years is about overcoming sickness and disease. And of course, the story about the raising of Jairus' daughter is about overcoming death itself. And as we've been working through Matthew's Gospel, we have seen that the dominant theme of the Gospel is the Kingdom of God. It begins with an invitation to become a member of the Kingdom of God. It goes on to tell us the means by which we become a member of the Kingdom of God. It actually tells us what the marks of someone who is a member of the Kingdom of God are. And today, as we look at these four stories of people who encountered Jesus, we have been shown what the kingdom of God will look like when it comes in its fullness. There will be no more storms, uncertainty, unpredictability. There will be no more evil, conflict or violence. There will be no more suffering, sickness or ageing. There will be no more death. Can you imagine a world without storms, without financial and economic worries. A world free of relationship breakdowns that cause us so much grief and pain. Can you imagine a world like that? Yet that is what Jesus promises. Can you imagine a world without evil, where there is no more theft or political corruption, where there's no more violence or abuse, where there's no more war or killing? No more natural disasters, no more earthquakes, tsunamis or cyclones. Can you imagine a world like that? Yet that is what Jesus promises. Can you imagine a world without disease and illness? A world where the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. A world free of cancer and viruses and addictions which hold people in bondage. A world free from the effects of ageing. Can you imagine a world like that? Yet that's what Jesus promises. Can you imagine a world without death? A world free of the heart-wrenching goodbyes, of staring down into the grave of someone we love. A world free from the fear that our lives will one day end. Can you imagine a world like that? Yet that is what Jesus promises. A world free from the storms of life, A world free from the threat of evil and violence. A world free from sickness, disease and ageing. A world free from death itself. A world free from fear. Unfortunately, that type of world without fear is a long way away from the reality we currently experience. Because we live in a fallen world that has rejected Jesus and the kingdom of God. We live in a world which would rather live with uncertainty and unpredictability, would rather live with sickness and disease, with violence and evil and even death, than submit to the rule of God. As a result, we find it difficult to imagine a world without storms, without evil, without sickness and without death. And so this morning, I want to take you on a journey of the imagination as we reflect upon these four stories before us, not as separate stories, which is so often the way they're read, but as a single story of what life as a member of the kingdom of God is like. And the first of these four stories is the calming of the sea, which Joel preached on last week. Now, to fully understand this story, we need to understand that for Jews, the sea represents fear. Water and the sea always stood between the Israelites and where they wanted to go. The Red Sea stood between them and their escape from Pharaoh's army. And it had to be calmed or parted for the Israelites to pass over. The Jordan River stood between them and the Promised Land, and they needed to cross over. And as a result, Jews, despite the extensive coastline of Israel, never became great seafarers like the Philistines before them had. In fact, we read in the Psalms about the great Leviathan of the deep and a fear of the sea. 
In the book of Revelation, the sea stands between the faithful and God himself. It is something which needs to be overcome. Thus, in Revelation 21, verse 1, we read, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. There was no longer any sea. And what this statement is saying is that there is no more uncertainty, no more chaos, no more fear. There is nothing that now stands between us and God. And so in verse 4, which continues that text, there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for this older order will have passed away. And when we understand the symbolism of the sea, the story of the calming of the sea takes on a whole new meaning. Jesus was with his disciples as he is with us. In the midst of the sea, in the midst of of the chaos and the uncertainty of life. And suddenly, as in the, is in the case of life, a furious squall came up. And the waves began breaking over the boat so that it was in danger of being swamped. That, in many ways, is a metaphor for our lives. Just when all seems to be going well, the unexpected occurs and threatens to sink us. Who would have predicted COVID-19 and its economic repercussions? The interesting element of this story is that Jesus was asleep in the stern of the boat, apparently oblivious to what was going on. How often in the midst of our crises do we feel that God is asleep or absent? The disciples woke Jesus and asked, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Is that not the question often on our lips? Where is God in the midst of our crisis when we feel as though we are about to drown? And Jesus got up and rebuked the wind and the waves and immediately the sea was calm. He overcame the fear. Then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Don't you realize that if I am with you, You are safe. Now note the response of the disciples, verse 41. They didn't say, yes, Lord, you're right. We shouldn't be afraid. Rather, we read, they were terrified. And they asked one another, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Perhaps their reaction should not surprise us. In Isaiah 6, verse 5, the prophet declares, woe is me. For I am ruined, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So as Isaiah sees God, he says, Well, am I am ruined because I'm in the presence of God himself. In Revelation 1, verse 17, John wrote, When I saw him, Jesus, in his glory, I fell at his feet, though dead. And throughout these stories, we will see people falling at Jesus' feet. While people have a fear of the unknown, they have a greater fear of the presence of God. Which we see in the second story, the Gerasene demoniac. When Jesus and the disciples arrived on the other side, in the Gentile region of the Gerasenes, we really that he was met by a man with an impure or evil spirit who lived in the tombs because no one could bind him or control him, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but had torn the chains apart and broken the leg irons. Night and day, we read, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and he would cut himself with stones. Truly, A terrifying picture, a terrifying man. Could you imagine hearing his cries and his howls at night time echoing through the surrounding hills and the fear that that must have instilled in the people of the surrounding region? In Matthew 8, verse 28, there is a slight variation to Mark's story in that he tells us that there were two men, not one. 
And he says that they were, quote, so violent that no one could pass that way. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. This man or these men are the epitome of evil, uncontrollably violent and unpredictable. Just like the storm on the sea, uncontrollable, unpredictable and violent. And we are filled with fear at unpredictable violence, at random violence. And when Jesus got out of the boat, the man ran towards him. Now imagine the fear of the disciples as this unbathed, unshaven, naked man with chains still dangling from his hands and his feet rushed towards them screaming obscenities. In Papua New Guinea, part of the welcome to country in many villages entails painted warriors rushing towards you, screaming with spears in hand, and they drive the spear into the ground at your feet. And even though I know the custom, I still find it somewhat terrifying as painted warriors come screaming towards me with spears at the ready. We read that this man was screaming out, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Have you come to torment me or to torture me? And Jesus said to him, What is your name? And he replied, Legion, for we are many. And they begged him again and again to allow him to send them out into the pigs. They begged him not to send them out of the region. Now, that's a very interesting statement. They begged him not to send them out of the region. Their request to remain within the region is significant because this was a Gentile region. And therefore, this is intended to give us a picture of what it looks like to live in a world free from the rule or the reign of God. This is not the region where the members of God dwell. It was a dark, ungodly region, symbolised by the presence of a violent man with an evil, impure spirit. Symbolised by the presence of a people who made their living via impure means of breeding pigs and who later beg Jesus to leave their region. A people who prefer to live with evil and the threat of violence rather than to live under the rule of God. And these unclean spirits, having begged to be allowed to enter into the nearby herd of pigs, were given permission. And we read, they came out of the man and they entered the pigs And the herd, numbering about 2,000, so it's a large herd, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported to the town what had occurred. And when the people came out to see Jesus, they saw this evil, this possessed man sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. See, that picture there is a picture of what the kingdom of God looks like. A kingdom without evil and violence, where the man is dressed and in his right mind and at peace. Now you think that the people would be grateful that this man who had terrorised them for so long and made it impossible to travel that way was no longer a threat to them. But instead we read in verse 15, they were afraid and they pleaded with Jesus to leave their region. In other words, the pigs and the money that those pigs represented was more important to them than this man's health and well-being and more important to them than peace and stability within the region. These people would rather live with the evil and the violence that this man or these men represented than live under the kingdom of God. And we live in a world that continually chooses to reject Jesus and his kingdom because the world fears God's presence more than it does living with evil and violence. It fears the peace that might come 
at a financial cost or at the cost of having to give up impure living. We often bemoan evil and violence in the world. And we often ask God why it exists. But the reality is it exists because we allow it to exist. And we do so because we benefit often from its existence. We are happy to live in a world where certain people are confined to the tombs and the outskirts of society so long as they don't impinge upon our lives and our livelihoods. We are happy for the sweatshops to exist so long as we benefit financially. As a result, we reject God's kingdom because the peace and the healing it brings comes at a cost, financially, any lifestyle that we simply don't want to pay. Jesus left that region, and as a result, it remained a dark place, other than the light and witness and presence of the man who'd been healed. As Christians, we stand like that healed man as testimony to the power of God to bring peace and healing in the midst of a society and world of darkness, a world that continues to choose evil and violence and financial gain over peace, stability and healing. We then come to our third story as Jesus crossed back over the lake, back into Jewish territory, the place where the people of God exist. He was met by a large crowd. And while there, a leader of the synagogue, a man by the name of Jairus, came and, like the demoniac, fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with Jesus to come and heal his sick daughter. In verse 23, we read, He pleaded earnestly with Jesus, My little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hand on her. Imagine how distraught and desperate this man must have been. And again, we see this repeated pattern emerging. The disciples tormented by the sea, which threatened to drown them. The Gerasene man, tormented by an evil spirit, which had destroyed his life. Jairus, tormented by the life-threatening illness of his 12-year-old daughter. And in the midst of this encounter between Jairus and Jesus, we read of the woman who had been, and I quote, tormented for 12 years by sickness. And we read as Jesus is making his way to Jairus' house, a large, large crowd followed him and pressed in around him. And in verse 25, we then have this account of a woman who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years, who had spent her entire life saving, all her money, going from one doctor to another, only to find that her condition was getting worse rather than better. And there are many people with aggressive cancers who, like this woman, spend all their money travelling around the world, trying experimental drugs in the hope of finding a cure, only to find often their condition worsening. Can you imagine the torment this woman must have felt? And the woman heard that Jesus was in town. But knowing that her condition rendered her impure, but like the demoniac, she decided to come up behind Jesus and simply touch his cloak, saying to herself, if I come up behind him in the crowd and touch his cloak, I will be healed. And that's what she did. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was cured. The problem was that Jesus also stopped. And turning around, he asked, who touched me? The disciples at this point were confused because the crowd was pressing in and lots of people were touching him. And so they responded, Lord, there are people pressing in and touching you from every side. Why do you ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who it had been. Now, there's a number of cultural issues at play here. Firstly, a woman was not allowed or permitted to touch a man to whom she was not related, especially a rabbi. Secondly, anyone 
who was bleeding was deemed ceremonially impure or unclean. And therefore, her act of touching Jesus would have rendered him, under the law, ceremonially unclean or impure. As a result, this woman would have been extremely hesitant to come forward and acknowledge what she had done. And in verse 33, we read that eventually, knowing what had happened to her, she came and fell at Jesus' feet, just like the demoniac had, just like Jairus had. Trembling with fear, she told him the truth. You know, this woman knows the enormity and the implications of her actions. And as a result, she's filled with fear to the point of physically trembling. And Jesus, upon hearing what she said, responded, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed of your suffering. That's what life in the kingdom of God is like. An absence of disease and suffering and pain and torment. Now in the background, of course, while this is all taking place, is Jairus. Now imagine the anxiety and the fear which is growing within him. He wants Jesus to come and heal his sick daughter who's at risk of dying. And he's being waylaid by this woman. Today it would be a bit like an ambulance rushing to respond to a critical 12-year-old. Critical condition. And then pulling over so the paramedics could treat someone that they saw lying on the side of the road. Jairus must have been thinking to himself, this woman has had this condition for 12 years. Surely she can wait a little longer. My daughter can't wait. And perhaps he was wondering why, given the fact that Jesus was responding to an emergency, he would even bother to stop and inquire who had touched him. After all, who touched him? Why would you stop for that? The anxiety and the fear within Jairus must have been increasing exponentially with the passing of every minute. And of course, news of the inevitable comes to him. Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? While his daughter was alive, there had been hope no matter how near death she was. And we hold on to hope while there is still life. But once death comes, that hope dissipates. What would have been Jairus' emotions and reactions at that point? Was he angry at Jesus for having allowed himself to be delayed? Or was he simply overwhelmed with grief at his daughter's death? And in verse 36, Jesus overhearing the news that was told to Jairus said, don't be afraid. There's those words again. Don't be afraid. He said to his disciples, come and see. Why are you afraid? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't give way to fear and grief. Even in the midst of painful bereavement, there is still hope. The Apostle Paul tells us, that we grieve, but not as a people without hope. There is a Christian hope in the midst of pain and suffering, even the pain of losing someone we love. The ache of losing someone we love reminds us that we need to long for that day when death will be no more and when we will be reunited with our loved ones who have gone before us. And as Christians, we often place great emphasis on Good Friday and the suffering and the death of Jesus because we can relate to that. And we rightly place much emphasis on Easter Sunday and the resurrection for it's the hope that we hold on to. But we very rarely reflect on Easter Saturday. In fact, I suspect we treat Easter Saturday simply is a day of waiting before Easter Sunday celebrations. And yet Easter Saturday is where we spend most of our lives, the majority of our lives, living between the pain and the suffering, the grief and loss 
of our Good Friday experiences and the Easter Sunday hope of new life that we hold on to. And we live between those two. And that's Easter Saturday. Living in the in-between time in which the kingdom of God has come, but has not yet come in its fullness. See, COVID-19 is an in-between period as we grieve what has been lost and as we wait for what is yet to come. It's a time of uncertainty and fear. For Jairus, the walk back to his home was a time of uncertainty and fear, a time filled with grief and sorrow. But walking beside him was Jesus. In those times, when we walk the road of uncertainty and fear, grief and sorrow, even death, we don't walk alone. Jesus walks beside us, offering us peace and hope, a peace and hope beyond our comprehension. And Jesus told the crowd not to follow him. And he went on with his disciples and Jairus. And when Jesus came to Jairus' house, the mourning process had already commenced. People were crying and wailing loudly. And in verse 39, Jesus went in and said, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, simply asleep. And we read, they laughed at him. And Jesus went and took the girl's hand and said, Talitha, meaning little girl. Kum, meaning come here or get up. And immediately she stood up and began walking around the house. And the people there were astonished and amazed. So what do these four encounters with Jesus tell us in the light of what we've been looking at over the past few weeks about the kingdom of God? Well, what these stories are telling us, and they are a collective, is that if you are a member of the kingdom of God, then the time will come when your greatest fears will be relieved. A time when the storms of life will cease. A time when evil and violence will no longer exist. A time when sickness and ageing will be no more. A time when death will be a thing of the past. Because there will be a new heaven and new earth. And God will have made all things new. Over the past few weeks we've seen God's invitation to become part of his kingdom. And we've seen the means by which we do that. And we've seen the marks of what that means. Now we're seeing what that looks like to be a member of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is appealing to us through these stories to become a member of his kingdom of God. May we hear these stories and may our imagination allow us to get an insight as to what the kingdom of God is all about and what Jesus is doing in our midst and to choose to be a member of his kingdom and to know his peace and his calm in the midst of the storms and the violence and the evil and the sickness and the death of this life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, We just thank you that your word is indeed a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. And we just pray that the scriptures we have reflected upon today may indeed lighten our hearts and give us new insight as to what your kingdom of God is all about. We pray that your Holy Spirit may be poured out upon us and may give us the strength and the courage to apply these truths in our lives, that we may indeed live as members of the kingdom of God, and we may be salt and light to a darkened world. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
join with me and the whole church family at Epiphany as we bring our requests in prayer to God our Father. A prayer for the day. Creator God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Teach us to offer ourselves to your service that here we may have peace and in the world to come may see you face to face. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. After each section of intercessions, I will pray, Lord, in your mercy. The response is, hear our prayer. We pray for the peace of the world, the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority. We pray for the people of Lebanon, especially the city of Beirut, that they may receive international financial and material support to help them through the great challenges they face. We pray for the nation of Belarus, that there may be a peaceful and just outcome to their current troubles. Dear God, we pray for the nations of the world as they struggle with the COVID-19 pandemic. Grant a spirit of cooperation between nations and help politicians of all parties to work together for the common good. We give thanks for the progress being made in Victoria in combating the second wave of this virus. Give wisdom, patience and stamina to our Prime Minister Scott Morrison, our Premier Daniel Andrews and all those in positions of authority that they can protect our communities. And we pray for the successful development of a vaccine that will protect us against this disease and that it will be made available to all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the Church and its mission. Lord, we pray for your Church throughout the world. Grant that the Church may be a source of hope and good news. Bless all congregations as they struggle with physical separation and pour out your Spirit to maintain the life and witness of the Church. We pray for your guidance for our Vicar Glenn and our ministry team, for our church wardens and parish council, for progress with the building project and for the success of our church program for the prevention of violence against women. We pray for the work of our pastoral care team as they seek to keep in touch with all members of our church community and especially for Gary and Joel as they provide leadership. We give thanks for the various ways in which we can find inspiration, encouragement and fellowship online for our Sunday services, midday reflections, evening prayer times, Bible study or life groups, the women's chat line, men's group, ladies group, young adults and youth group. Lord, bless all those who work to provide these online activities. We pray for your encouragement, protection and guidance for our link missionaries, Chris and Grace Adams in East Timor and Chad and Erica Loftus in Thailand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for ourselves and for our community. We pray for all those whose incomes have been reduced or lost at this time. May their needs be supplied. Lord, we give thanks for those who continue to care for others in dangerous or vulnerable situations, particularly those from our congregation who care for the sick and elderly. Please sustain them and keep them and their families safe. We give thanks for all the community groups that volunteer to help people in need. Lord, bless them in their work. Lord, we ask your blessing for the anxious and the disappointed, for students, teachers and parents coping with home learning, for the lonely, for those unable to be with their loved ones. Lord, be with them, grant them your peace and answer their needs. Help us, Lord, to be good neighbours to those around us. 
and we pray that our local community will work together to stop the spread of the coronavirus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those in need. Dear Lord, we pray for comfort and good care for those in nursing homes, especially Graham Smith, Joyce Churchland, Jean Argyle and Pauline Thomas, as they cope with extended isolation. And we pray for those who are grieving over the loss of loved ones. Lord, Grant them your peace and comfort. Comfort and heal, we pray, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or any other trouble. Give to those who care for them wisdom, patience and gentleness, and to us all your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you have called us into your family as brothers and sisters in Christ. Grant that we, with all your saints, may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your kingdom. Father, accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our service of worship this morning. There's a few announcements that I need to draw to attention. The first arises out of our recent parish council meeting in which there was a request for our kids time segment in the service to be more interactive for children. As a result, we are reviewing removing the kids time segment from the main service altogether and replacing it with a 20 to 30 minute children friendly service which will follow the main service. So that means our main service will be an hour to hour 10 in length, followed by a 20 to 30 minute service specifically for children. Um, as a result of that, we're in the throes of getting together props and material for that children's service. The second announcement is we're changing our midweek mix. When we first went online, we established a Monday, Wednesday and Friday reflection at 12 noon and since then we've had requests for more variety and more prayer. As a result we are taking away the Monday and Friday reflections and leaving reflections only on Wednesday still at noon and of course we've introduced on Monday at 6 p.m. a prayer meeting and on Tuesday and Thursday evenings at 6 the evening office. The other announcement that I wish to draw to your attention is that during the week we have been communicating with our ward councillor and our deputy mayor um, as well as the senior planning officer of the Wyndham City Council with regards to our planning permit. The hope is that we will have that permit in hand by the end of next week. There are a number of negotiations going on so I draw that to your attention and ask for you to continue to keep that in your prayers. As our financial year starts in October and obviously finishes in September, we have commenced the process of working through our financial forecasts and budget for the 2021 financial year. Uh, this will inevitably involve a change in our current staffing mix as we budget for reduced revenue over the coming 12 to 24 months. So again, please keep that in your prayers as we go through that budget process and as we speak to staff about the needs that we will have in the next 12 months moving forward. As for the annual parish meeting, uh, we are negotiating with the diocese what this will look like and there's a possibility that we might simply roll over our parish council and wardens from this year for another 12 months. 
Well, that's all the announcements this morning. And so let us just close with a blessing. May God stir up within you the gift of the Holy Spirit. That you may confess Jesus Christ as Lord and proclaim the joy of the kingdom of God wherever you go. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you and all whom you love now and evermore.